every time something feels scary, it's usually where the best ideas is at. There's magic in that risk and there's magic in that fear. In 2006, a St. John student named Ibrahim Hamad had an idea. As he sat down in the Honda Civic of a classmate, the undergrad's ears were unexpectedly flooded by a freestyle courtesy of that very car-owning friend, Jermaine Cole. From that moment on, the Queensbred Hamad dedicated his every effort to realizing the ambition of his best friend's talent. From confidant to A&R to manager to business partner, Hamad grew his role and responsibility in synchronicity with J. Cole's success. Together, they built a label, a festival, an entertainment company, and most importantly, a brand. Dreamville. And it all started with one idea. My family's from Sudan, but okay. I, yeah, I was born in France. We moved around a lot young because of my dad's job. So it's like we moved to Qatar for like three years, came back to France for another three years, then went to, to Queens. And I thought I always thought that was cool because every summer we were going to stay in Sudan. So it's like, you know, it kind of shaped yeah, the exactly. world to you. How did that sort of like global experience growing up change your worldview? It was huge because just being able to see the world at a young age, you knew right away that it was bigger than what was in front of you. And you know, like I know that from when I got to America and I knew some friends that had never traveled. So for me, I think that helped shape my understanding of people more than anything. And you know, once you understand people, I feel like you can kind of find your way around. You obviously had to recreate yourself mm -hmm. over and over and over again. Sure. How did that sort of shape the person you grew into? You're always kind of the outsider, you know what I mean? Like, if I'm in Paris, I'm like the kid from Africa. If I'm in the Middle East, it's like, you know, you're black. When I got to Queens, I was for sure the outsider at this point, because I'm coming in, I got like a French accent probably at the time, you know what I mean? Like, I knew English because I went to schools that, that taught English. But when I got there, it was like understanding like, oh, you need to adjust quick. Like, ain't nobody here gonna wait for you to adjust. And for me, it was um, the fact that I played basketball and I learned football quick on the yard, like just being outside of school. And that allowed me to like make friends while I was adjusting to a whole new culture. How did your parents' professional life inform your ambitions? What I got to see was my dad working super hard to take care of five kids. He was out there working every day, dropping me off to school, then driving to the city to work. You know, so it's like that kind of molded, I want to say like, my personality in a sense, because I've always been someone that wanted to make sure everybody around me was good. When you arrived in Queens, Queens was going through kind of a renaissance, and mm -hmm. I would argue the home to where the greatest rap music ever was being sure. made. Yeah. How like closely connected to that were you? When I got to Queens, um, I'll never forget, it was like the first album that like I bought. I sent my brother to buy it because I couldn't go to The Wiz. Nobody beats The Wiz, shout out to The Wiz. <laughs> Was, um, was It was written. If I Ruled the World was out, being in Queens, obviously Nas was the GOAT, you know what I mean? Like, he was the guy, and all those years before that, I was in France listening to it. Now I'm like, oh shit, I'm here. Like, I'm around the people that's talking about these things. That kind of, I think, shaped what I always look for in rap. Because then from there, you know, it was like Pac through my brother, Big, and DMX. And around that time, like, I started realizing, like, I really enjoyed the emotion in rap. Pac would say things that you would feel and it was like, it wasn't about how wordy or how clever it was. It was just like, it was just an emotion that was connected with you, same with X. How did you end up going to St. John's? My oldest brother, he went to St. John's. So I told my brother like, yo, I, I think I want to go to St. John's because it's literally 10 minute walk from my house. I knew it was right there. I knew it was a good school and I knew I, you know, I had the relationships to get in. When you did that though, did you have any sort of sense of like, to what end? Like, was there? No, that's the thing. Like, I knew I loved sports, mainly basketball, and I knew I loved music. To be honest, it's like, when I got to school, it was just lit. I was like, <laughs> I was outside, like, you know what I mean? Just hanging out. And I just wasn't as focused as I should be. I kind of got lost in the experience of college, more so than like the studying. But I also feel like the experience of college is just as important as the books. You know, like the people you meet, the how, how to be, interact with different people from different places 
that taught me so much that lasted through the rest of my life. I was to the point of how I met Cole. Yeah. You know, we were hoop, and me and Cole was just like always somehow guarding each other because we were both tall kind of guards. But I didn't really like fuck with him like that. I was just like, I know him. I see him around, cool, whatever. But being that I was from there, he would link with me, go to the parks, like, you know, like the local parks and hoop. Or I take him to parties in Queens, and that's really how our relationship started. And then, like we all, you know, he became part of the family basically. Meeting Cole and starting to develop that relationship. At what point did you realize that he was a musician, and not only a musician, but like a serious musician? I didn't realize it for like probably like a year. I think one day I jumped in his car, and like he had like um, a song playing. It was um, it was the Grammy Grammy Family Freestyle that he had. I'm like, yo, who the fuck is this? He's like. Oh, that's my shit. Uh, he was about to turn it off. I'm like, bro, this is crazy. Like, I didn't know you rap rap. He's like, yeah, but I don't want to tell people. And then I look like I'm just one of these other guys that's just rapping. Like, now nah, I'm, I'm going to get signed and then I'm going to show everybody. And I was kind of like, I respect that, but it don't really work like that. Like, you kind of have to let people know or start putting something out. And I had no, obviously, no experience. And even at the time, I didn't think like, oh, I'm going to manage this kid. or I'm going to be a part of this kid's career. It was like, yo, this is my friend. What do you do if you believe in your friend? You just try to like help him out. I mean, he does it today, but even back then, it was like he would give me a song, be like, yo, don't send it to nobody. Like, you know, he was one of those guys, but I would ride around to it. I would play for my homies, and we would just sit in the car and they'd be like, yo, this is hard. Who's this? I'm like, Jermaine. And everybody would be like, oh, light skinned Jermaine, because they know him from playing ball. At that point, it's just like a badge of honor to tell someone, like, yo, listen to this. And then they're like, oh, this is dope. Whether, whether you know them or not, like, there was nothing like putting someone on the music. And that's really all I was doing is, is putting people on. But then I convinced them, like, yo, we should put a mixtape together, which was the come up. Because I was like, yeah, you want to get signed, but people have to know. People have to, like, know that you make this music. Success is feeling good and fulfilled with the work that you're putting out there and feeling like you can stand behind it and then seeing it connect with people. If it doesn't connect, then you're not going to feel like it was successful, but if something connects with people, that's really success. When you guys started to think about putting together this mixtape, you're starting with one fan, two fans. Yeah. Like what was that process of building the fan base? I mean, because at that point, like you said, he didn't talk about it very much. It was actually fun as fun. It was the most fun because that's when you got to be the most creative. We got the guy Pooh that used to like make the the CD sleeves and cases on Jamaica Avenue to make it. Maybe he's gonna like pass it around a couple people. I picked up a camera and I was shooting footage of him in the studio and I was editing on Windows Media Player like really badly. And we just uploaded it to YouTube. They still up there, like, you know what I mean? Like then we would go back to North Carolina. We would go to AT Homecoming. And that's when we came up with like, yo, you know what? We're gonna sell these CDs for a dollar. Cause if you ask people for five dollars, they're gonna be like, I'm not giving you five dollars. If you give it to them for free, they gonna just throw it out. Yep. So that was the birth of like a dollar in a dream. I mean, he had this song called A Dollar in yeah. a Dream, but that was kind of like the idea of a dollar, you know, it, it always stuck with it. So, and then some people be like, how do I know it's good? And we used to be like, man, he'll rap for you right now. Like, it was just fun. Like, we will bring him through, he'll start kicking a verse, and they'll be like, oh, he nice, I'll give y'all five dollars. Or like, oh, this is his ten dollars. We probably gained, what, a hundred fans that night, but it, it, it it's not much, uh, you know, but it was, it was the idea that what can we do to try and figure it out? How were you guys financing all this? It was points where like my dad would give me like $20 to make sure I had food for the day and like I would split my sandwich with Cole because I knew he had nothing. We would put our, our money together to make sure we could press up the CDs. Did you guys have like a conversation about the nature of your role or was no, it you just- I was just going. I didn't even want to have a conversation yep. about it because I didn't know what it was. I just knew I'm a fan of this music. This is my friend. I know he wants to be the greatest and I want to help him get there. However, if it's telling 15 people, if it's telling 100 people, if it's being his A&R, if it's being this. Do you remember like a specific moment that it hit you that Cole's ambition to be one of the greats might actually be real? He did a show in LA and no one knew who he was. We didn't even have a DJ. I, I went and stood next to Whoever had a CD player be like, all right, fade out, fade out, fade out. All right, start playing. I right, play, go track three. And seeing him in that element was like, yo, this guy's going to figure it out. You really learn how to perform and you really become a, 
an incredible performer when you perform in front of people that don't give a fuck about you or that don't know who you are. Because you have to win them over. You know what I mean? If you're performing in front of people that love you, that's the easy part. At this point, are you guys trying to shop for a deal or? Yeah. And I remember a point where he was like, we was in the studio and I remember he, he was working on a song and somebody was like, man, that, that ain't gonna get a son. That ain't, and, and I just seen him like snap. Like, are y'all making this music? Like basically like, don't tell me what to make in a lot of other words. But I think that was an important, <laughs> an important moment because it was like him realizing like, I'm not gonna like jeopardize who I am or what I do to get signed. Like, if I'm if I'm gonna make a hit or something, it's gonna be on my own terms. And it was important for me because it made it gave me an understanding of like what he wants for himself. Cole was more so worried about the music. We were so naive that we just always believed the deal was around the corner. Cause if, if we really knew how long it would have took, like it's a good chance we would have gave up. I definitely have doubted myself. I think the day I stopped doubting myself or feel like I have it all figured out is the day that I probably don't love it anymore. Cole's manager at the time, a gentleman named Mike Rooney, pulled some strings utilizing his personal network that would lead Cole and Hamad to the attention of former Notorious Big Manager and Buy Storm Entertainment CEO Mark Pitts. It was Pitts who would ultimately land the duo a record deal with Jay-Z's burgeoning Rock Nation Records. Little did Hamad or Cole know, arduous as their pursuit of a deal had been, signing a recording contract would only be the first of many, many challenges that the duo would face in their ascension to the top of the music industry. So after, after we did the come up, Mike Rooney, who was managing him at the time, he knew Kirk Lightburn, which is Mark Pitts' cousin or like, you know, his family. He was like, man, I'm gonna play this for Mark. I'm gonna play this for Mark. And he like snugged the CD in, played Lights Please. Mark was like walking away, came back like, man, what the fuck is this? He's like, it's the kid I've been trying to tell you. He's like, listen, and he's like, man, you gotta tell him to come here tomorrow. Like, so the meeting went great. And we just ain't hear nothing back for like three months. And the whole time we like, all right, this Mark Pitts thing is, is done. But what we didn't know is Mark, I think he had the understanding, like, all right, RCA, this might not be the right place for him. And Jay was starring Rock Nation. So he's the one that took it to Jay. And Jay was like, all right, bring this kid over. So then Mark formally becomes the new manager yeah. around this time. So after he's after he got Cole signed, it was only right. He yeah. was like, yo, would you manage me? And he was like, yeah. At what point did you and Cole start to formalize whatever business relationship you had? Before he even got signed, we were already thinking of him as like this signed artist, even though he wasn't. And we was like, yeah, man, we got we got to have our own shit. Like, Jay had Rockefeller, Diddy had Bad Boy. That's all it was. Like, we got to have our shit. You know what I mean? What's our shit going to be? And that was the beginning of Dreamville, because I remember me, Cole, and RJ was in his room. And Cole was like, yo, I got it. I got the name. He's like, Dreamville. And right away, I was kind of like, I don't know. I don't know if I love it. His expl explanation for it was like, you know, like from Fayetteville, City of Dreams, like there was a dream to come to New York and get signed. He had the song Dial in a Dream on his first mixtape and his second one. So it was like, that was it. It was like, all right, Dreamville. But we didn't have no artists. We didn't, I always joke, like we was really just a merch company. Like that's all we did was sell shirts and hoodies that said Dreamville. What was the sort of nature of the relationship with Rock Nation and with, with Jay? What was their expectation? And, and what did you guys feel like was the challenge that was ahead of you now? With Cole, it was like, we had this big following, but it was kind of like, well, you need a single to get your album out. And we was like, well, what the fuck is that? Like, we do shows and it's 500,000, 2,000 people. Y'all are just not really seeing this. Y'all are not there with us. In that time, there was definitely like a few pump fakes, like Who Dat. Where Who Dat was a first attempt at a single. It was like, we need a single? Cool, here's this song, Who Dat. And then we had like, Blow Up. And then Jay was like, I remember he's like, yo, I feel like that's like a nine. Like, a, I feel like you got a 10 in you. We were just in the studio trying to make hits. No lie, I was probably the most depressed he's ever been, you know, like in making music. Cause it was just, he was trying to force something out of you. Like we was just like, it just wasn't enjoyable. It, it felt like this isn't what we signed up for. Like this isn't like what we love. Looking back, it was it was pushing it was pushing us to like, you know, unlock something specifically for Cole to unlock you know something that he had never even tried. What caused the breakthrough? Workout. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I think that was what opened the door for him to be able to to like take that step, but also feel like yo, this is still me in the song. 
you know, even though to his fans or to like, it was some backlash when it dropped because to them it's like they just want him to stay in that one lane. That was really the breakthrough because one, it allowed us to put out an album. I don't know if the label believed at that point. They was probably like, man, whatever, like, let's just get this shit out. Do you remember where you were when you got those first week numbers back? I can't remember the exact city, but I remember being on a tour bus and just being like, no fucking way. Like, it was just like a moment of like, damn, this many people really? Because somebody was telling me like, yeah, there was people with labels taking bets that y'all was going to flop. The week before it dropped, we were on a call. I think it was Rob Stringer at the time. He was like, man, we're so excited for this album. We think it could do, you know, 75 to 85,000 the first week, which looking back is incredible. Would have been amazing. But we were like, oh, if we do that, we're toast. Because the internet at the time, there was like a pocket of people that wanted Cole to fail so bad that, you know, after Drake comes out, does those numbers and who were, I think Big Sean might've did like 90 or something. If we'd have came out at 75, it would have looked like a failure. You ended up at 250? Like, no, 220, like 222 okay. or something, first week. So seeing those numbers was like, it was more a, like a relief of like, oh shit, we're okay. You have to be able to read through criticism and see what's real and what's not really. I think the people around me, their criticism is usually, you know, 99% of the time gonna be something that, that I, I can take and utilize to make myself better. The first album comes out and it does tremendously well commercially. Mm -hmm. But the reception critically and on the internet is still sort of mixed. What was that feeling like for you guys internally? I think it was a learning moment of like, oh, you can't take everything you see on social media like to the heart. And a part of it was the fact that we knew that album wasn't exactly what we wanted. You know what I mean? Like we, the fact that we sacrificed so much of the album for Friday Night Lights and then there was a lot of songs that like, were already out, but we had to put on there, and you know, just kind of learning the world of putting out an album. What advice were you giving him as he sort of started to wrap his head around the record that would become Born Sinner? I think for Born Sinner was dark because of that, you know what I mean? Like he was going through a dark time where he was feeling like he had still had to prove himself. I mean, we didn't really have those conversations like, how are you mentally or how are you feeling? But he puts everything in his music. So I would hear it and be like, oh, that, like, you know what I mean? When you heard Let Nas Down. Or I knew what, yeah, like, I remember when he recorded it. I always took Les Nas Down as like, that was really a song about letting fans down. Nas is just the representation of like, a group of, you know, of fans in a sense. You hear that and you know like, oh, those things were still bothering you. And you're still dealing with those feelings from what people might've said about workout or, you know, your first album, or not even what people might have said, the fact that you might not felt like you got it how you wanted it. Leading up to Born Center, about two or three weeks before the album release, you guys made an adjustment to the release date. He made an adjustment, but yeah. Really? Okay. That was how, all him. How did that happen? We had announced our album date. Kanye announced his album. You guys were going to be the week after him. Yeah, we was going to be the 25th. And he calls me, he's like, yo, I'm going to move my album up to the 18th. If I'm going to go play ball with the big dogs, I got to show up, basically, you know what I mean? If I, want to, if I want to see myself in the same light as a Kanye or a Jay-Z or a Nas, I got to be able to play with them. To him, it was like, I'm just going to move up and I'm going to put myself in the conversation. So after that album comes out, again, tremendous numbers. You get yeah. the number one. In certain respects, it seems like everything is going mm -hmm. better than it ever could have. But Cole sort of turned on a dime in that period and sort of pulled back and it seemed like he was kind of rejecting the rap game, the entertainment industry, mm -hmm. all of it. What was happening? I mean, the moment I always say was like the game changer was the BT award. His stylist had a bunch of clothes out for him and one of them was like a Versace sweatshirt. He had the Versace sweatshirt, the chain, the shades. I'm like, yo, that's fly. And his stylist like, you should wear that, you should wear that. And he's kind of like, uh, it don't really feel like me. He said, I feel like this something like French Montana gonna have on or something. He wore it because he was trying to make people around him happy and what people thought would make him look like a superstar. And when he walked out there, Drama had it on and I think Brandon T. Jackson had it on and he walked back to the back like, see? Like if I just trusted my gut and went with who I am, I wouldn't be in this position. For me, it was a moment too of like understanding like, damn, like I even fall into the moment where I want him to be something that he's not. Because I'm hearing the outside noise. 
You know what I mean? I'm trying to appease all the outside noise too. Like, yeah, you're supposed to look like a superstar. You're supposed to look like a rapper. But it's like, that's not who he is. So after that moment, it was an understanding of like, oh, okay. I'm riding with this. You know what I mean? Like, because as your friend, I'd rather see you happy than see you get a number one. Because number one clearly is not what's going to make you happy. With back-to-back successes under their belt, Hamad and Cole found themselves at a crossroads. The duo felt secure in their understanding of what Cole's fans wanted and their ability to provide that experience. However, the artist had lost his appetite for the pageantry of the music industry. Appreciating his friend's conviction, Hamad supported Cole and took advantage of the opportunity to step up his role and help his friend redefine what a pop star could look like. The sureness that he had at that point, it was kind of like he entered his own of like, look, I'm not going to play this game anymore. If I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose my way. I'm not going to lose the way y'all want me to play. In that moment of inflection, you also get sort of elevated from yep. being his right-hand guy mm-hmm. to his formerly his manager. Yep. Was that part of his sort of shift and reprioritizing things? I think it was just a moment of him kind of taking, taking the power back, whether it was through the music and not feeling like I have to do what the internet is telling me or what the label's telling me. Was Mark receptive to that conversation and that change? Yeah, I think I, the, him and Mark still have an incredible relationship. Mark was always like a big brother to him. But I think Mark knew like, yo, you're taking matters into your own hand. You're taking your career into your own hand. You know what I mean? How was that for you? Like, for me, this, was, was a, this is a huge change in sure. your responsibility. and for sure. It was a big moment because it was like, ah, he trusts me enough to do that. This was right before Force Hill Drive. You're going into your most important album. You're at the peak of your career. And to me, that spoke volumes because it was like, all right, now you, you have to deliver. And at the same time, I knew I didn't know a lot. I didn't know enough. When he would call me out on certain things that was a mistake, I used that as a learning moment. Like, all right, cool. Can't do that again. You know what I mean? And we learned a lot from Mark and Wayne Barrow and like the whole, you know, by Storm family. So it was kind of like we had the tools now to when we got to like towards Four Cell Drive, we like, all right, we can do this. And the understanding of what he wanted to do with the album, he was like, yeah, I'm gonna buy the house because it was been foreclosed for my mom. I'm gonna buy it. Uh, I don't know what I'm gonna do with the house, but I'm gonna mm-hmm. buy it. We're gonna have a listen event there. Then, you know, we just kept building on the ideas. And then he was like, I'm gonna just drop the whole album. Like, I'm not doing a single. And I remember because somebody at Rock Nation was like, what do y'all think, y'all Beyonce or something? Like, that ain't never gonna work, you know? But we just had to live with it. We was like, if we're gonna fail and these numbers are flop because of this decision, we gotta be cool with it because we made this decision. And that, that was the switch. I think you can tell an idea is good when it like gives you that feeling of like, like almost like you're a child and you start like either giggling or like you're like shaking your head. It's just a feeling that takes over you when, when you know you have a good idea. In that moment, you guys start to really pursue putting together Dreamville as a label. I imagine that there was many suitors that were trying to sign you guys. What made you go with Joey and Interscope? It was really two. Okay. Which was Interscope and Atlantic. And what made us go with Joey was he got it. You know, he got it the most out of anyone. He understood we were more interested in building our careers and like longevity for an artist, which is harder and it takes longer. Because we were coming from an idea that we want artists to be themselves. We want artists to put out what they want to put out and then we take that and see how can we help it reach a mainstream. We still gonna try to take that and turn it to number one, but as long as our way. Also, when you have this business and especially with a record label, you're in the red a lot. Mm -hmm. And when you start looking at the red too much, you don't want that to start allowing you to alter your decisions. You know what I mean? There's artists that they were in the red for a long time and now they're just in the black, but it's like, it's all worth it because yeah, we didn't really make money on them, but they'll, they'll be here forever if they want to. Cole has taken like a hard left in terms of how he wants to present his music and roll it out. And he's, it, it seems like where Forest Hill Drive still, it was on his own terms, but there are some home run For sure. swings on For that, sure. on that yeah, record. Yeah. Four Your Eyes Only and K.O.D. feel much more personal and sort of like he is catering to no one except for himself. As his manager, are there moments that you've been concerned or worried about these things? No, because we were on the same wavelength or the same page with it. And, and, and the thing is, in a weird way, they were like his least personal albums. 
where he kind of stepped back and he was more speaking of other that's people's true. things like KOD, Four Eyes Only, even though there's always a part of him in it because that's how he connects it back. It's like almost like a reporter. And he needed to do that so he could come back to where he's at now and be like, oh, this is where I am. Because I think Cole's biggest strength and why he has the fan base he has, even though that's a part of it, is really when they connect with him as a person. What are the hardest conversations to have as a manager? I would say when, when you fuck up. <laughs> For me, it was always like, I don't like disappointing people. So it's like, when you're like, damn, I, I fucked that one up. Like, that's on me. Other than that, it's really, you know, having to tell someone like, I don't really like this, or, you know, this could be better. What do you look for when you are looking at an artist for, for Dreamville? I really just look for connectivity. If I can connect with you, then I trust that the people that follow Dreamville are gonna connect with this too. You know, Kai's one of our artists that I think I, I work with the closest really because he's he lives in LA, he's working out of here, I don't live too far. It's just always been good, like back and forth of like, all right, what do you want to put on here? And he's good at taking like notes. What notes in particular when you think about, you know, all the conversations you've had with Eve really made an impact. One thing he tells me is to stop overthinking sometimes. Sometimes I'm like, I always like play him a song and I'm like, man, oh I gotta, God. bro, I'm the worst. I'm like, bro, well, this is why. He's about to play me a song. He always comes with a disclaimer. I'll be like, bro, I get it. It's not yeah. finished. She'd be like, I was just trying to stop. But I'm like, but to me, I know that's, a, that's like the insecurity of like, you know, he's an artist. So yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's just more so about finding a way to respect what he does and respect the fact that this shit is not easy and it's an art form. And then how can I make it better? He'll either be like, nah, I don't agree. Or if he agrees, He'll try it out, you know what I mean? I think that's all you can ask for from an artist, really. It's like, you know, just hear my suggestions and do what you want with it, you know what I mean? You know, it's just such a, a good feeling to know that you help put something into the world and people are really connected with it. And I think I, I chase that feeling more so than like any specific idea and the creative ideas that come or to reach that feeling. What are the most important skills that you've learned in your time as a manager? You know, just being passionate about something and making sure that you lead with passion and then really trusting in your gut, you know what I mean? Because that's that's really what I end up doing. It's like, you gotta trust in what's connecting with you and what feels right. You can't like suppress what doesn't feel right because you feel like it's gonna work because then that shit always comes back to bite you. Like Cole doesn't do anything just to do it. Neither does Jid, neither does Ari, neither does Bob, all the way down the line. Definitely our brand Dreamville doesn't do anything just to do it. So then it's like, why are we doing it? It's because there's an opportunity to tell these stories in different ways, whether it's through merch, whether it's through documentaries, whether it's through a podcast that we did. We're gonna push ourselves outside of our comfort zone, but we're not gonna stray from who we are. But music is still the most important core of it. Without the music, everything else is just gonna fall apart. In 2018, you guys endeavored to do probably one of the more ambitious, biggest things that you've done to date, which was to have a festival. How did that start? It took us three years from when we thought about the idea, getting a mayor, getting uh, you know, the city on board, getting the police force. It really gave me a whole new understanding and respect for like that side because it's a lot of work. When you see the power that you can have over a city's economy, it's like kind of dope. And then seeing the actual festival and seeing people having the time of their life, seeing our artists all look like superstars out there. Like the boss said was so loud, the Jizz said, the Ari said, the Loot said, everybody said it was so loud that it was like, man, we build our own world. And um, and to be able to sell it out the first year, 40,000 people, 97.8% of people was like, yeah, I'll come back next year. And it's coming back. 2022, April 2022. It's such a special thing for for us and for, for our fans and for our brand that it's like, we want to make it every year thing. How did the Dreamers session for Revenge of the Dreamers 3 happen? So initially I was like, we got to do a session with all of our artists in the same place. We've never done that. A few days before that, Cole was like, man, we should make invite. I was like, all right, that's interesting. We started sending out to our artists and producers. That shit just went crazy. Like everybody was like, yo, I'm coming. And there was people hearing me like, I just want to invite. I can't make it, but can I post the invite? What really made those sessions special is people got there and they would see Cole walking around like he was damn near a new artist. So once there's no egos there, nobody had an ego. Everybody was like, all right, it's time to work. 
If you don't step up and grab that ox chord and play your beat, or if you don't write your, your verse real quick and like you're gonna get left off this song. And people was competing with each other and and, and people was growing relationships. So that was like those 10 days, man, it was just something special. And that was just something that that was what Dreamville is about. So what do we have here? Some trophies? Once in which is actually now two times platinum. <laughs> but I didn't order that. This is the one that changed and, everything and, for you. Yeah. And and honestly, this is another one where now it's, it's three times platinum, but I just didn't order the new one. But one day I'll I'll put all these up and it's gonna be it's gonna feel like a like a special moment. Right now I feel like if I put them up, especially in my house, like I would just feel like too content or something. Yeah. So it's cool keeping them in storage. When you think about sort of the goals that you and Cole had for the label at the outset, and you look at what you've done in the last five, six years, mm -hmm. how close do you think you've come to honoring that original? We're there. We're just expanding what, what that was, what that idea was. You know, initially it was just like a rap crew, you know what I mean? But then it became an outlet for artists to be able to be themselves. Because I think at the core, of Dreamville is we're storytellers. We're storytellers that tell stories that connect with everyday people, that connect with people, you know what I mean? You're now a man in your mid-30s. You've achieved more than most will ever in their entire lives. Outside of Dreamville and outside of coal, what are the things that you're looking to do for yourself in the next 10, 15, 20 years? It's really all been about family. You know, I had, I had my two boys. One of my son is like two and a half, the other one's like about to be five months old. For so long, I felt like my day-to-day -day happiness came because of like my career. And then when I had like my kids, it was like leave work outside of home and just enjoy being home and enjoy this. And I feel like that's like right now, you know, that, that's like my, my main thing. In my career, the other things I want to do, I think the sports, world specifically basketball is where like a passion of mine but I don't want to be the, the music guy that just like hey I'm just coming to sports like I really want to learn it learn from people in that world you know pick their brain which I've done and just kind of go from there.